Hi, everyone. Welcome to MusicWise. My name is Donato Cabrera. I'm the music director of the California Symphony and the Las Vegas Philharmonic. And over the years, I have been so lucky to meet people who are so inspiring, uh, uh, musicians who are engaged people, first and foremost, wanting to connect through their art. Uh, it seems to me that regardless of what you do within our varied world of music making, uh, the desire to connect seems to be the um, driving force for so many. And my guest today is uh, really a leading example of that. I've known Nathan for quite a while since I was a music director of the San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra. And he's gone on to do many brilliant things. He was doing brilliant things then. And he is now the assistant principal cellist of the Seattle Symphony. So welcome, Nathan. Hey, Donato, thank you so much for your kind intro. <laughs> well, it's certainly my pleasure. And it's wonderful as what I love about this show is that I get to see faces of folks that I don't really get to see that often anymore. I think reaching out in this way has been a, a, a salve for our souls these last few months. And um, just th thank you for being available. You're, I take it you're in Seattle at the moment. I am, I'm currently in Seattle. Uh you know, just wrapping up a, a summer filled with lots of nature and outdoors and uh, so excited to be returning to work uh, in the middle of September. So I'm kind of getting ready, getting back into gear and just looking forward. You know, every all orchestras, in, including the California Symphony and Las Vegas Philharmonic, are, are coming up with ways to remain engaged with, with our um, with our folks that love our orchestra so much. Tell us a little bit about the plans that this, you and the Seattle Symphony have come up with beginning in the middle of September. Um, well, we have a wonderful um, plan to basically record as usual uh, our concerts as if they're actually happening and have the regular rehearsal schedule, but then to live stream the concerts on the weekend. And so it's something that I think is going to be a little bit different for all of us, but I think just having these couple of months uh, off where we haven't been able to make music together has really given us all a time to reflect and really appreciate, you know, this thing that sometimes we take for granted when we're in the, the grind of it all. And uh, I'm so uh, looking forward to that. Uh, are you going to be recording in Benaroya Hall? Yes, we are. Yes, that's we wonderful. Are. That's that's great. And uh, has the repertoire changed at all, or will it be s somewhat similar to what you were going to offer anyway? Nathan, you're on mute somehow. Hello. Sorry, did you? Uh, I must have dropped out there for a second. Go ahead. Go ahead. Begin, begin with your. Yes, so ahead. Go ahead. No, begin no, with your. I, I didn't hear what you were uh, yeah, answering. Yeah, 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 yeah. um, so basically, I believe a lot of the programming is being changed to facilitate more smaller ensemble works. And I feel lucky as a, a string musician that I think I'll be able to partake in, in a lot of those. Um, and. Uh, we're just looking forward to creating a different type of musical experience that, of course, fits within these um, very unusual times. Nathan, you've, you've always been um, really engaged with uh, with your with your music being and using technology ever since you were really young. Tell us a little bit how that started um, and and where you see it now as an adult. And in general, sort of how the industry has had to embrace that. Um, it's been a really weird and wild journey for me in terms of my relationship with technology. I think much of it was, in fact, circumstantial. I think um, growing up as a millennial, I grew up with, you know, learning how to use floppy disks and playing my first computer games on a very old PC. And so I've always sort of had this um, naturalness with technology as sort of a, a way of life. Uh, but it wasn't until perhaps mm, my realization that the combined um, 
usage of video and music could be such a powerful draw for those that like us consume and love classical music. I think some of my first wonderful experiences with music were of Leonard Bernstein's Young People's Concerts and of course the amazing recordings of the Berlin Phil with Herbert von Karajan, sort of pioneers in the world of bringing music to the TV. And, you know, growing up, I, uh, those, those videos made such a huge impression on me, but I never thought that I would myself become involved in sort of the production of things like that. But I think it's such a natural thing where, you know, I think it's a Renaissance era where we all have phones that can create and capture, you know, it'll, it'll never be the same as a live performance, but in some ways I think there's um, a good compromise and trade off in terms of the power of being able to take music outside of a traditional concert hall and really reach a lot of people, especially in these trying times. You know, you bring up a good point because in fact, I haven't really thought about this until now, but you're absolutely right. There have been leaders in classical music who have been incredibly advanced for their time and technology. I think a perfect example actually is Herbert von Karajan, who helped Philips develop what became this, the compact disc. He, wow. he I didn't was, know that. Yes, he and, and also with Sony and Philips, he uh, was friends with the, with the, um, the CEOs of both companies. And he said, listen, whatever he was approached with this technology, he said, listen, the, the, the length of a CD needs to be long enough to put a performance of Beethoven's ninth symphony on it. Wow. And that's why it's 80 minutes. The CD is 80 minutes long. And to think it, it is inspiring to think that, uh, that a class, it was a classical musician who brought digital technology forward in such a profound way. And I think for many of us these last few months, we felt sort of thrust into this new world of streaming mm -hmm. concerts. And, mm -hmm. and even this show that we're, we're both doing now is sort of yeah. a result of, of this. But in many ways, uh, I think it's good to realize that we have a role in being leaders in, in bringing music forward in a in a in a profound way through technology and i think it's so it's so wonderful to hear what the seattle symphony is doing all the other orchestras are are tackling this issue in their own way and out of that will emerge a new paradigm of connecting to many more people than we were right mm -hmm. i definitely agree but i i also want to acknowledge the fact that there there is an inherent resistance to these types of new mediums. And I, I, you know, I want to, you know, address that point of view as well, because I think, you know, things are a little different for, for all of us right now. And I think my, my main MO is I, I, I understand the technology and I respect it so much, but I understand folks that don't really see it as a, a replacement of live, but I want to really um, just say that there is a way to very s symbiotically adopt and embrace this platform in a way where you don't lose the integrity and the authenticity of, of what you're trying to bring to others. I, I think that's always been something that I've been conscious of and trying to be more conscious of, you know, you don't want to a stranglehold the technology to adopt your will, but you want to really understand what it can offer and what it can't offer and really find a way to merge it in a way that's natural and organic. Absolutely. And, but of course, we'll never know that unless we're doing what we're doing now, which is trying right. new pathways. Right. Some will work, some won't. And from that will emerge new and successful ways to connect. And I think that's, yes. I think that's, it can be painful. It can be sort of, you know, searching in the dark, taking those steps, not knowing what, what will happen next. But I think that's, you know, in the end will be a really uh, exciting uh, step forward for, for our, I hate to use the word industry, but it's sort of right. like, it, it is what it is. Right. So uh, Nathan, you, you mentioned that you, you were always sort of connected to, 
uh, classical music through videos through performances mm -hmm. was this something that was a family experience tell us a little bit about how you became exposed to classical music uh, well, my beginnings in classical music started quite humbly and actually with a profession that you're quite familiar with um, in watching those famous uh, videos with Lenny Bernstein and, and Herbert von Karajan, I was really drawn actually to the art of conducting. Um, I think there was something very fascinating and I'm sure you'll agree with the connection between physical movement and sound. I think so much of of, of what we try to embrace as musicians is this form of communication. And to me, seeing it so clearly um, delineated in a physical form, in, in, in motion and, and your rhythmics and things like that, that, that was very powerful to me. And so actually at the age of five, I, I, I would take a chopstick and stand in front of the TV and sort of be entranced by these wonderful conductors and, and was very fascinated with with all of that and so i i actually got my start in conducting i mean I, it is it is a uh, it's similar to what happened to me a little bit older than you but the same i the, the same fascination with what you say your rhythmics of how a gesture can be so successful at creating a specific sound and of course you mentioned two incredible examples Leonard Bernstein and and Herbert von Karajan and of course there's Carlos the Car the famous Carlos Kleiber video yes always, the best they're, they're so amazing and and to uh, I think it's uh, I think for all of us regardless you know you're now a, a cellist who you you get the such the, a pleasure of 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 course working with your wonderful new music director but you have many guest conductors that come and right. and you can hear it it is I I try to tell people tell this story that um, it, it's like having uh, uh, 50 painters come into the Louvre and mm -hmm. have them sit, sit them in front of the Mona Lisa and each one tell them to paint exactly what they see. And what, uh -huh. what, emer what would emerge are 50, would be 50 entirely different paintings of yes. the Mona Lisa, right? Yeah. And it's the same with, with conductors, guess week, week in, week out, you have conductors that come through the Seattle Symphony. And mm -hmm. it is extraordinary without conductors saying hardly anything, the sound that they get from an orchestra, that it could be, it's night and day from week to week, is it not? Tell us a little bit about that. I totally agree. And there is a sort of intangible energy that can be felt when there's a certain type of presence on the uh, on the podium and it's so hard to explain but yet it's so easily recognizable and understandable when you feel that connection emotionally uh, even with your soul about the way someone is trying to craft sound and i think you get a very interesting perspective seeing lots of different conductors on the podium and how they approach what I think is our, our all common goal is and is to create great music. And, you know, I think I've learned so much about the rehearsal process, too, because, you know, as a conductor, that's, I would argue that's probably one of your most important roles is, you know, a, a lot of orchestras can get it to sound good, but getting from the beginning of the week to the end of the week to really that journey and that path in bringing people together behind a unified vision and convincing them in various different ways, whether it be physical, verbal, um, emotional, it's such an interesting thing. It really is a, a lesson and kind of sociology and in, in, in the way community communities come together and in fact, I think that's probably one of my favorite things about playing in an orchestra. It's that witnessing that journey and learning how humans make connections with each other and how this form of negotiation goes on within this realm of music. So well said, Nathan. I want to get back to, so it was conducting that sort of was the initial um, interest. Then mm -hmm. how did it become the cello? How did it go from conducting to cello? Uh, that's a very good question. You know, I think um, in some ways this intangibleness that we discuss of that makes conducting so beautiful uh, was um, 
a little bit of uh you know hmm let, let's see if this is legit or not and so applying that kind of those kinds of feelings that i was feeling towards a physical instrument was a good way of um really solidifying what perhaps i felt intangibly into something tangible so mm -hmm. i actually was really fascinated with the low sounds of the orchestra and i imagine a I can remember a very specific scene in one of Berlin Phil's Beethoven five videos when the double basses are just so lined up perfectly in this kind of like beautiful perspective. And they're playing the, the, the two notes in the Beethoven five where they're repeating in that powerful sound. I, I was really drawn to it. And I think I still am drawn to it. whenever I listen to music outside classical music, I always am drawn to the bass. Um, but anyways, I wanted to play the bass at first, but um, I, I was a small kid and I am still a, a pretty small person in general. So my parents decided, well, let's take it a step down. And so I began playing cello. <laughs> you know, you know, you know who's watching? I don't know if you can see the the comments at all, but Liz Dorman is watching. Speaking speaking Hi, of a bass player. <laughs> oh, she's and she's a mean cellist too. I think she, she transfers her that that skill to cello. Hi, Liz. Oh, it's so great to see her on the chat. <laughs> So okay, you've 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 shared with us a few of your incredible. Well, let's actually backtrack a little bit. Yes, please, please, please. Um, so, cello and so you you what age did you start learning the cello? I or, started playing the cello when I was five. Five, and you know we got to know each other in in in. I'm, I know you feel the same way. Mm -hmm. The the San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra is like all youth orchestras, it's a, it, it can be such a special life-changing experience to be in, in with, with, within a group, as you mentioned before, within mm -hmm. a group that we, that are all like-minded mm -hmm. in their love of the music, in, in their exploration of the music, often mm -hmm. for the very first time they're experiencing these compositions. It's a really magical thing, a youth orchestra. Mm -hmm. And we were both lucky to be a part of the San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra. And I started near near the end of your tenure, I would mm -hmm. say, right? I, I think the final- your Kind final, of the second half, yeah. Right, second half your of final the... two years were my first two years. Uh -huh. And uh, can you talk a little bit about how, what, what the experience was like for you being in the San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra from, from your perspective then? Oh my gosh, I would say, being in the San Francisco Symphony Youth Orchestra was probably one of the most influential uh, music making experiences I had, especially in the realm of critical listening and the use of sound in relation to others. I, you know, growing up when you're learning an instrument, you don't have that many opportunities to play with others than perhaps chamber music. And I also, I think, learned so much about non-string instruments, the way a conductor would verbalize how th that sound should be shaped and articulated. But um, anyways, being able to go to Davy Symphony Hall every weekend and spend all those hours there with wonderful colleagues of exceptionally high level and, and then learning from section members of the San Francisco Symphony and then applying that into wonderful rehearsals was an amazing kind of affirmation of uh, my love for music and sort of the larger role that we all must respect whenever we choose to enter this um, craft. Um, the, the, the importance of lowering, one, lowering one's ego in service of a greater good was such a, a monumental concept that was kind of imprinted on me during that time. And just, um, there was a, there was a kind of a, a, a nice stature about it, the excellence and the, the professionalism that I loved about the organization that also really, I think, taught me so much. I re for you during your final year, you, uh, you won the concerto competition and we did Shostakovich's uh, cello concerto number one together. Yes. And, and I, I'll never forget that experience because, well, first of all, it's one of my, it, it's such an amazing concerto, regardless of instrument. It's just, it's so, 
uh, it's so Shostakovich. It's one of his the, the things that you if you if you recommend mu to someone who's never heard the music of Shostakovich, of course, you probably would suggest the Symphony Number no. Five. But on that yeah. list would also be the Cello Concerto. I and, totally and, agree. Uh, I remember I was so excited to do it and, and to do it with you. And uh, I'm curious, was this your first time playing a concerto with orchestra? And if, if so, even if not, mm. um, can you share what it's like playing as a soloist, especially with your colleagues supporting you? Because that's a unique experience unto itself. As it really is. It, as opposed to playing in a section. Yes. Um, it, I have such fond memories of that experience. I, I remember working ex extremely hard for that opportunity and, and just kind of really that art of applying myself for that was a really great lesson in, in the discipline required in this profession. But also, um, of course, as you said, the wonderful experience of having a whole gaggle of of friends and colleagues there to support you in this adventure was an extremely motivating and encouraging type of of, of experience for me and you know playing as a soloist with orchestra is something i've i've done a couple of times but i feel like i learn something new every time and it's kind of kind of strange you know if i'm going to get super super personal i I find even throughout the week, my interpretation of the piece kind of changes. I, I know a solo is, supp is supposed to come with their interpretation and, and sort of, you know, try and kind of lay his, his or her ver vision out. But I find the process so um, reflective in a way where I assume one thing was going to operate a certain way and I realize it doesn't and I realize a different approach is necessary to best serve the, the the end outcome. And I, I really enjoy that process. And I think now that I've done it more and more times, I think I, that process be, has become faster for me, but I certainly playing with the, with you un, under your baton and that experience taught me so much. Um, especially I think in terms of for that piece, stamina, Shostakovich cello concerto number one has a massive cadenza in the third movement where, you know, there's not only physical stamina, but emotional stamina to really have the concentration to lay out the storyline because it is so powerful when um, the theme returns in the fourth movement back and, and just to really tie those concepts together. And I remember my teacher at the time, Xin Lin, was very adamant about me really getting the complete picture of a concerto together and, and kind of really enforcing the importance to play the piece from beginning to end several times, because I think once you're learning a concerto, it's so easy to do a lot of micro adjustments while you're enhancing mm -hmm. an experience along the way, but to really step out and take a vision, because ultimately that is what an orchestra and an audience member experiences in a concerto. That was, I think, one of the important lessons I learned for that experience. You know, it is interesting. And now that I think about it, the that is a, a challenge, particularly with that concerto, because it is the the, the cadenza is in the final movement, which mm -hmm. is common. Most major cadenzas for most concertos are in the first movement. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there, I mean, there's a lot to be said for that because uh, I mean, it, because of what you just said. Because when the cadenza, if the cadenza is in the final movement, like the Shostakovich's, you really have to be able to pace yourself. Emotionally yes. and physically to yes. have the energy to convey those incredible emotions that are in that particular cadenza. Right. Right. I remember, I now that you bring that up, I remember that that we were we were talking about that during the rehearsal process of like, okay, maybe we should start the rehearsal with the third movement today. So right. really delve in, <laughs> delve into the specifics and then yeah. the first movement of the second movement. Right, right. That that's interesting. I I forgot about that in our rehearsal talks, and that, that's also a, another kind of peculiar thing. You know, typically when a soloist rehearses with orchestra, I don't know if, for the viewers out there, uh, a soloist will typically skip the cadenza because you know the rehearsal is really for the orchestra's time and to really 
bring the that part of the performance together but then of course the day of the performance you usually have a run through with a dress rehearsal and i think that's also another very uh, intimidating thing about that piece too is to have the entire orchestra during that very intense cadenza uh kind of be there and 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 it's kind of examining and and trying to feel your your perspective of that is it's interesting when did you start using video to to communicate your art mm. um i think the first time I, I i really communicated video through art was actually for um an hbo uh, documentary called the music in me uh of course i didn't create the documentary but it, it really was my first foray into this kind of combined world. And in that documentary, I play the Swan by Sanson. And the documentary uh, portion is unique in that it's not just a performance of, of me playing the Swan, but it also includes kind of a, an interview overlaid on top of it, kind of explaining my story of the Swan and what it means to me as I'm playing. And the sort of behind the scenes uh, look at music uh, has been something very fascinating to for me. Um, I think it's something that, you know, we all try strive to do in some way with pre-concert talks or post-concert Q and A's. Uh, I think people str are really intrigued in that kind of mentality of the performer or the conductor or whoever in their vision. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, so that was my first foray into video. And then eventually I um, started producing videos for YouTube. Uh, as a way to share some of the crafts uh, of my art form. And I remember actually, now that we're on the subject of the youth orchestra, that my first really produced video was with a wonderful violin, violin colleague named Alex Fager. And we produced a cover of the Super Mario Brothers theme for violin and cello. And that was a really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a, a really fun kind of thing because um, I think usually, uh, my what was what I was doing on my YouTube channel was kind of uploading old recital and concert mm -hmm. footage, you know, uh, as a way for archival purposes. But then to create something directly for the platform that was something unique. But it really made a big difference, and it kind of showed uh, the possibilities in creating music with beautiful visuals and things like that for YouTube. So. Did you, did you, uh, I, I want to play one of the videos uh, you, you've, you've shared oh, sure. in a minute, but did you ever have any sort of uh, collabor collaborations with uh, direct film directors to sort of help you con connect the cinematog uh, cinematography of what you were doing? Or was this something that you learned on your own? Um, you know, certainly through a type of osmosis, seeing how other directors had you know, film me either for this television show or for actually another subsequent uh, TV show I was on uh, in the UK on Channel 4. It kind of showed me the all the behind the scenes work and energy that's needed to really create and craft film. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it really uh, sparked an interest in cinema. And so I think starting in high school, I started taking film classes in high school. And that's where I started to get better at you know editing video and then eventually i i learned some things about uh, audio production just a way to really take all these nebulous things and kind of really take charge of them so that i had an understanding of what was going on and how i could do it myself okay so tell us a little bit about this the the first one that we're going to play it's la vie en rose one of my favorite uh, yes. songs by uh, sung by Edith, Edith Piaf originally, although it was sung by many other artists, but yes. she's the one who made that when made it famous, sort mm -hmm. of her signature song. How did you come about deciding to record this? And tell us a little bit about this, how this project came to be. So this uh, video was created near the beginning of quarantine, and it was requested from me by Fondation Louis Vuitton uh, in partnership with uh, a master class that I partook in with Cellus Gautier Capuçon um, in my second year master's at Juilliard. I spent uh, 
six weekends flying to Paris and and really learning from one of the great cellists of our generation. And so they requested that some of the previous uh, cellists of his master class create a little video. And I thought, you know, well, we're we're in France, so why not do uh, La Vie en Rose? And uh, maybe we could just watch it. We will. Let's 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 take it. Take it. Okay, you know, that's beautiful. Uh, it's uh, tell us about when you want to do something. Um, when you want to make, obviously, there's not an arrangement probably for four mm -hmm. cellos. Uh, although there are many, there are ma arrangements becoming available for cellos more and more to, right. today. But do you do your own arrangements? I do sub. Uh, for that one, I actually used a, a good friend's arrangement for that. Uh, my experience in arranging for multiple cellos. Uh, primarily lies in uh, a cello ensemble that I was in in college called String Theory. It was a five-person cello ensemble uh, at Columbia uh, where we kind of ventured into all forays and genres of music, pop, jazz, we even did some Bollywood music, and it really kind of taught me the uh, magnificent potential of the cello as an instrument, especially in terms of its range and character. Um, the cello is a unique instrument in that its its range is very much like the human voice. I'm sure you've heard that many times, uh, but it really does lend itself to um, a lot of different types of music, and it's something that I, you know, I've grown to really love and embrace. And so, I, I've I've always loved cello ensemble music. It's probably one of my favorite types of music. You know, when you were mentioning. Uh about your experience working with Gautier at the Vuitton Foundation uh, mm -hmm. Masterclass. It reminds me of when uh, Gautier came to do a Masterclass at San Francisco. And I think this was probably your, was your first meeting with him. I think you yep. played our Schubert's Arpeggione Sonata for him, if, I, if my memory serves. Oh, you remember. <laughs> I barely remember. <laughs> yes, that was a, that was a very interesting experience. I remember we were, the master class was in kind of the one of the basement rooms in Zellerbach. And, uh, you know, here was this magnificent French cellist. And, um, you know, uh, you know, I don't, I don't remember a lot of things that happened, but I certainly remember his sound was such a amazing presence in the room. He has one of the most intense and rich cello sounds I think I've ever heard. And it was funny that you mentioned that meeting because later on when I was in Paris, I, I, I pulled up a photo of us from that masterclass and, and I showed him, I said, you know, I actually played for you once before. And he was like, wow, he had no idea. And it, it was a, a nice kind of circle of life thing. So good memory. Hey, I, I, I sometimes it comes through. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh, you know, I, another thing you mentioned, which is I, uh, uh, I don't know if you remember Annie Wu, but she, yes. was, you know, of course. So she did a similar de uh, degree program as you as you did, mm -hmm. uh, with, but she did it with, in Boston. You did this uh, incredible partnership, this double this uh, partnership between Columbia and Juilliard, mm -hmm. which I think is so healthy. Maybe you, I mean, you you went through it, so I'm just. I'm just, it's just conjecture on my part, but we're having academic courses at Columbia and then also mu the musical courses at Juilliard. Tell us about this program, how you decided to do it and yes. what in the end uh, did you glean from, uh, how, what, what did you learn from experiencing that program? 
That's a wonderful question. I think uh, leaving high school and entering college, I wasn't quite ready to com commit myself to a certain type of craft or profession. I had Growing up, I had always placed a, a lot of importance in both my music and academia. And so it, the, the, the kind of the discipline required to do both had always been in my blood. And so going to Columbia seemed like a, a, an extension of that. But it, in fact, it was when I was kind of in the thick of that program that my love for music and my draw to become a professional became stronger and stronger because at Columbia, you, I met some of the most, the, the smartest people I've, I've, I've ever met. And uh, I felt certainly quite stupid there. <laughs> and I, I think the most important thing I realized is my desire to make an impact on the world would be most facilitated and, and most impactful if I committed myself strongly to music. And I think that was a really important turning point for me because I, first of all, I had a wonderful cello teacher that I got to work with, uh, Richard Aaron at the time. And he really taught me a, a unique perspective to cello playing where I became much more independent as a critical thinker. I, he, his big MO is giving cellist the tools necessary to really approach any musical or cellistic problem and really figure it out for yourself and I feel like with that agency of being able to really self-analyze that gave me a lot more confidence to really pursue cello uh, with much more intensity and so that was a big turning point for me in terms of my overall mindset. Mm -hmm. Would you would you characterize that as giving giving you the tools of of having your own agency? How it, not to use the word intellectualize it in a in a disparaging way because obviously we want to we want to focus on expression, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. but as you I guess what you're saying is what you learned through through your teacher at Juilliard was that there needs to be an a, a, an approach to give you the tools to express yourself at the highest level. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that this is an important thing for all aspiring musicians, all, inspire, all inspiring artists in general is, is that, is, is that the, the tools of the trade is, is an incredible intellectual pursuit that, that it goes beyond just learning your scales. And it's, it's about how you solve problems. Yes. And, and problem solving in music can be, uh, a never end. It is a never ending pursuit. Uh, with with even pieces like the arpeggioni sonata, it's something you'll be playing for the rest of your life, and it's yes. something that you'll constantly be re examining. Mm -hmm. Yes, I I certainly agree, and I think it speaks to a a point I want to make where, you know, these problem solving tools are there to enable us to more freely express ourselves. At least that's the way I think about it technique is a is a a thing to master so that in the moment you can free yourself of its shackles and really feel comfortable expressing without with the knowledge and the confidence that your skill set is backing up your musical intent uh purposefully i guess Absolutely. And it sort of brings us back to what we were originally talking about in the use of technology. It is just, I, I, again, correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, or, mm -hmm. but is it not just yet another tool to solve a, a, a solve a, a current problem? And that's, that's so what true. great musicians that we're, we're always we're always looking to find the best and most immediate ways of communication. And now we're exploring this because we must. That's such a good point. Way to bring it back. Uh, yeah, in, in a way, it, it, is, it is just another tool. And one can explore its creative possibilities to really help us communicate. I think, I mean, you said it beautifully. 
you, you've been part of this, these morning sessions. This is another clip that you've sent, and yeah. and you're sharing, you're sharing one of my all-time favorite pieces. Both of uh, the Schubert piano trios are just, they're up there with the, with the great chamber music pieces. Yes. And Schubert has many of those, in my opinion, in my pantheon of great ch chamber music pieces. We, you know, we have the piano trios. We, have, of course, the string, the string quintet. We have yes. all, all of his string quartets. I mean, the list goes on and on. The, the piano quintet. It's the the octet. Anyway, <laughs> we yes. could have a whole hour on just Schubert's chamber music and play Absolutely. our favorite. Uh, tell us a little bit about these morning sessions that you've been involved with. So this collaboration. Uh, is with a colleague in the Seattle Symphony named Andy Leung, a great friend of mine, and also uh, a conductor and pianist named Kelly Kuo. I'm sure you know him. Uh, he was, in fact, our conductor for a run of, of um, uh, this unique opera that we had done earlier in the season. Mm -hmm. uh, it was um, a jazz, kind of not, not straight up jazz, but a very interesting jazz and classical work and we immediately connected and we had this wonderful opportunity to create this work so uh, I hope you all enjoy it. <laughs> Let's hear it. I have so many questions, but my first question is, how do you keep that towel on his head? I know. <laughs> you know, I feel like I didn't get the ammo. I really should have. I should have matched something in their wardrobe, I, but I was. You were really I, you know, I missed, behind, I Nathan. Oh. I know. I really didn't hold my own, but uh, <laughs> I'm really happy with the way they, that turned out. And actually, if I could, maybe I could give a little kind of a technical explanation on on how some of these videos works, because I think, you know, I'm sure you've been seeing many many more of these types of videos uh lately and one one of the important things that i 
try and do when I'm making these videos is, well, typically people usually play to a click track in order to make these things happen. Right, but, just for, yes. for people who aren't musicians, yes. it's impossible for, for everyone to get, if, it, if you're in your apartment, Alex is, his in, is in his apartment, Kelly's somewhere else, the three to record together simultaneously is literally impossible. That's just, yes. a, it's, a te it's technically impossible to, in today's world of streaming. It's just not, there's too much latency. Yes, yes, absolutely. And so that kind of creates this inherent problem of, music that's supposed to be free flowing and natural can sometimes have this tendency tendency to sound robotic and and kind of you know something feels a little bit wrong so actually when i create these videos i try and go a step further and when i create the click track i actually am manipulating ritardandi and rubato and accelerandi in the click track itself whenever mm. i set these things up so in a way, I, I'm trying to, you know, embrace my inner conductor and I, I find myself, oh, I'm singing along to the click track and trying to make sure if I were to play this in real life, where would I slow down and where would I move the time forward? And that creates a very nuanced type of click track. Of course, it's not 100% the same, but it can some, sometimes mitigate some of that unnaturalness in these types of videos. And I think this video was a great example where you there was Ritardandi and Rubato, and it, it, we were still able to hopefully kind of communicate some of that. Well, here's one, here's a question, and this might be, this is a little one, taking the nerd factor one step even more is, did, did you provide a click track, because this is at a slower tempo, did you provide a click track that was an eighth note, so you could do eighth note Rubati? Ah, I love your question. So if the if the timing is quite regular, then I'll do big beats, quarter notes. But then to set up the robato, I'll go into halftime. So I'll go da da, and then let's say a measure before the ritardando, I'll go da 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 da. So I love that way, people can really feel that subdivision. And, and the, yeah, I, I do do that. That's it. That's a great thing. Because <laughs> if you can't, if you can't anticipate the retardando physically, you need that subdivision to get that's right. the information, right? And that's a, and that's a, not just not for all musicians, but us conductors, that's what we're constantly obsessed about. At least cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, I, so w getting back to Going back to this double degree, um, what happened after the gra after graduation for you? Were you you had made the decision that that pursuing music was what you wanted to, to spend your focus to focus on, and so then upon graduation, did you uh, continue with school? Did you decide to what what happened? So. I made a very conscious decision where I felt like I didn't really want to do any more schooling after my master's. I, I really wanted to get into the, the nitty gritty and the grind of being a musician. And I had a very frank discussion with my teacher, Richard Aaron at the time. And he said, well, maybe you should consider, we should start really working on your excerpts to you know start taking some auditions. And I remember that experience first was very challenging for me. Because really? I- Really? Yes. I felt exploring the world of excerpts, it's, it's a whole different animal preparing, a t preparing for or orchestral auditions. I, my, my, good, my good friend Will Chow, who was also in the youth orchestra and now is in the Pittsburgh Symphony, once told me that, uh, you know, excerpts are simply the, a collection of the worst written uh, parts for any instrument, like parts where a composer really just didn't really make it very nice for any of us. And here we are, and we're expected to really, really, really just um, the totality of the execution, the musicality. We need, we're expected to master that. So already by then, I was like, oh boy, this is kind of a strange thing. But at the same time, it, it gave me such a unique uh, extra component to my, my, my cello playing, uh, the ability to kind of 
go into an audition and 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 execute these excerpts that I I'm very grateful for and um yeah it was it was a very unique experience kind of transitioning my brain into a different type of cello preparedness so what was that audition road like for you were you mm. were you taking did you take many auditions did you take only auditions that it appealed to you so you could have time to prepare them what was that like um I had about a six month period after I graduated where I was really taking every audition under the sun. And mm -hmm. I think, I don't know if many of our, many of the viewers recognize this, but um, the orchestra openings are kind of few and far between. And so you kind of have to put your hat in the, or put your foot in the circle whenever you get the chance um, because I think that's an important part of not only the uh, getting more comfortable with the regularity of the audition process, but also just the sheer numbers of it. You know, you want to give yourself every opportunity you can. And so I was taking every audition in the sun. I was practicing like crazy. And it was a really wonderful, well, <laughs> wonderful is not the right <laughs> word. It was a, it was very grueling, to be honest. Yeah. And I think the part that was the most trying for me is, you know, I I ended up taking maybe four or five auditions, and every time I, I there were times when I would get very close and unfortunately not kind of be the last person standing, and that can take a a a big mental toll on you, and once again I had to return to this confidence that was instilled in me. Uh, through Richard Aaron that saying, you know, you, you have the tools you need to continue to make yourself better. And you just need to, you have to pick yourself up off the ground after moments like those where it feels like you've worked so hard and unfortunately things didn't work out your way. And I think that taught me a lot of resilience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it's something that rejection is never something that I would wish upon anybody but at the same time, all of us in this world have experienced some sort of form of rejection. And it's really about how we operate after rejection that really shows one's true character. It couldn't be more true, Nathan. I, I agree with you a thousand percent. And of course, one, you, you off, often want to tell yourself and you were, I'm sure, told this is that, hey, you you made it to the final round on an, on any given day, anyone in the final round could have won that audition. And right. so, yes, it's, 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 that is very much often the case, very true. Right. And, but still not winning the audition is that's, it's still the reality. So it, it's, yes. it, it is a, it is how you respond to those moments of adversity mm -hmm. and, and the audition road uh, is, is an arduous one. That's w without doubt. It is. So I have to say that uh, I, I really love this next, um, next uh, excerpt next uh, video that you've shared shared with us because uh, i've done frequently these concerts uh, mm -hmm. called the, the music of they're sort of this my uh, my homage to the world of film com composers and the first one that i did with with the uh, las vegas mm -hmm. philharmonic was the mu music of john williams of course who else would you uh, you know choose nice. first that first concert of film composers and it was so successful that we we had to schedule another one not oh, cool long, but, but the, the year right after that and this so so uh the Saruaya's theme from uh memoirs of a geisha uh it, is just wonderful and it was it, it was one of the magical moments of that second concert because it's so touching it is it's like it really so much is. of his music tell, tell us why you chose this and and how this came about well, I've always thought that uh, John Williams is an incredible cello, uh, comp cellistic composer. Um, he, he writes not only the most beautiful themes, but also really, I think, captures a, a kind of quintessential essence of the cello. And I would call that the mellow cello. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, you know, whenever yeah. you think of cello music, you kind of think of you know kind of sad and soulful music and we we cellists do a really good job of expressing that and 
especially in this movie, Memoirs of a Geisha, that really um, tells a story uh, very deeply touching, but also deeply bittersweet story of a, of a geisha in Japan. I, I just was super drawn to this. And, and I think what's also very fascinating about this is the fact that John Williams, who he himself is not a Japanese person, I think he probably, he did an incredible amount of research and kind of understanding um, this kind of world of Japanese music. And he captures it so well in, in, in this clip. And it's, it's a great cello solo too. <laughs> yeah. Let's watch it. Thanks.
it's you're so right. He he really captures the the spirit of the of the character through the those harmonies and and it's just it, it really it's 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 remarkable what he yes. can achieve through and we we all know this to be true that the, all of the movies that he's scored without his music it's less than half of what the movie can be absolutely I, it adds so much to the film and i just love the way he uses the range of the cello he's not staying in a certain range he's he's slithering and and and, and going deep and 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 stirring up these textures and emotions and just the direction of the way he comes from range to range it, it's so el it, it's full of elation when when the theme returns and i i just love that so much so you you do you have your you take you take your steps down the road of of auditions and mm -hmm. you now find yourself as the assistant principal cellist of the of the Seattle Symphony what what does that mean for those of those people that are watching the the title assistant principal? What are your what are your responsibilities? Uh, uh, where do you sit in the orchestra? You know, just hmm. what does that mean? Um, I would say the the role of an assistant principal is is quite unique in that for a majority of the time you kind of create this unique bridge between the principal cellist and the rest of the section. Um, I, I sit right behind our principal cellist, F.A. Baltichigio, who's an amazing cellist, probably one of the most inspiring cellists I've ever met. And kind of, you want to channel one's principal energy down the line. Um, but then also when, you know, F.A. is not available, I have the role to step up and sort of play this principal cello role. And it's kind of amazing the difference in mindset one requires when uh one is playing at the principal cellist i think there's there's an extreme amount of care and detail and focus required to really um kind of have that responsibility of your section on on your shoulders and so that's been a very unique experience for me to learn not to sit back and and reflect and channel but also to step up and lead uh, in terms of sound and energy and everything. And so it, it's been a very unique role for me here at, at Seattle Symphony. And maybe one of my favorite components of the job is uh, I often get to play principal cellist for opera in the Seattle Opera because we share the same orchestra at the symphony and, and the opera. And I've been exposed to this whole new world of, of, of operatic music. I've played continuo in opera which is something i'd never done before and that requires another type of hyper awareness there's a difficulty you know in terms of distance between a pit and a stage in a singer and i find myself connecting with the conductor at times but then also when there are times where there's not enough time to, uh, there's a little bit too much latency between the conductor i find myself connecting with the singer and looking at their mouth and anticipating the the way they're going to to play and so it's a very interesting role you know it's it's a uh, it's so great that you've had this experience because i would find i would say that in general uh the majority of of american musicians beginning they don't unless they get into an opera orchestra which there are a few mm -hmm. in this country but by and large this is a this is a symphonic country right and right, right. and and which is the opposite in so many ways to a european experience more often than not if you're an, a, a young orchestra mm -hmm. player you'll get into an opera orchestra that also plays symphonic music and i, I and, and i think that um, the experience of playing in opera really can inform your the way you play and respond in a way that you would never ever have just playing symphonic music. I totally agree. Even the writing itself, where the orchestra is less the the main part, but yet needs to be such an integrated bed of of color and 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 character for all this wonderful thing that's happening on the stage. Even just kind of comparing how a composer writes for opera versus how he composes a, a symphonic work has been very interesting. The bass lines feel a little different. 
the texture feels different. That's been interesting too. I bet. So our the final uh, final uh, video that you've shared with us is a piece that. Uh, originally was written for a small string ensemble, and then Schoenberg expanded it to a larger string ensemble. Yes. And this is this is one of his, uh, and well, there's so many wonderful pieces by Arnold Schoenberg, but this is a piece that's what, that he composed right before he went into tw writing 12-tone music. And this is his great um, Verklärte Nacht, Transfigured Night, based on the poetry, the poem of Demel, uh, and and of course, what is uh, I was just uh, so funny you you shared this because I, just the other night I was talking about Verklärte Nacht and how um, this is such a wonderful piece to expose the music of Schoenberg to people that may not know his music because wonder, there's there, the poetic uh, uh, connection is is just so odd it's literally word for word mm -hmm. the poem mm -hmm. and the music uh, and tell us about this arrangement though because this is for violin and yes. cello, and this is always with your friend Andy. Right, so of course in Verklerk de Nacht, there's the, the requirement to have two violists in in this wonderful piece, and of course, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know how to play viola, but <laughs> one of the wonderful things that I finally got around to learning is uh, learning how to read viola clef over this quarantine. I, I, I figured out some tricks in order to make it fit under the hand. And so this was a wonderful way to kind of apply that newfound knowledge. And uh, the my friend Andy, in order to make it work, he actually tuned his strings down uh, <laughs> to match viola tuning. Of course, it's different between violin and viola. And it, that caused his, he said his intonation was all wonky, but somehow we made it work and we had a little <laughs> fun along the way. So here let's, it is. Let's watch it. That's the moment where where the the man he accepts her for who she is regardless of of her past and this has, has nothing to do with what what she's thinking why he might not accept her and he just he i just that's a great moment in that it is a great moment and, and i i you know i have to confide in you that i i've actually never played the piece live before but i i was actually planning on performing it at Marlboro this summer. Uh, but unfortunately, of course, lots of things were canceled this summer. So hopefully I'll get the complete uh, version of it in my bones at some point in my life. And I'm just one of the great pieces. Uh, the it is, but you know, the coda, the coda for our poor, your poor colleagues in the violin section. I've always, I always, it always sort of, I see the beads of sweat starting yeah. to form. It's fiendishly <laughs> difficult. It's yeah. So difficult. Yes. <laughs> Nathan, this has been such a wonderful hour plus talking with you. I don't, I, 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 we could continue talking for the rest of the afternoon, but um, thank you again for being on MusicWise this week. 
Oh, thank you so much for having me, Donato. It's so great to see you again. And uh, always, it always feels so great to talk with you, you to, to feel your passion and your positivity. And I'm so glad you're, you're, you're doing these, these little conversations. And I, I, I hope the viewers uh, learn something each and every time. And I, it was my pleasure to be a part of it. Well, hopefully we'll see each other soon. Please give my best to the rest of your family. And oh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be making music together again in the future for sure. I so look forward to it. Let's keep in touch. Thanks, Nathan. Okay, bye-bye.